Dear friends and colleagues, uh, we are ready to move to the next session on the main stage, uh, which this time is going to feature uh, a live interview, uh, both for you here at the, at the festival, but also those of you watching on the Euronews uh, online channel. Uh, we have uh, invited one of the most uh, prominent politicians at the moment in Europe, uh, a candidate for the top job in the European Commission, but also a long-standing supporter, both of the European movement, but also of our Democracy for Alliance. Uh, Margaret Vesseger will be discussing on stage, together with Isabel Santos from the Europe for the Euronews channel, uh, everything about uh, democracy, competition, technology, everything under the sky. Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Petros. Hello, I'm, I'm Isabel da Silva. I'm a journalist working as European Affairs correspondent at Euronews Brussels delegation. And it's my pleasure and honor to be here with Commissioner Margrethe Vestager, Commissioner for Competition. Thank you very much for coming. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. All right, so uh, let's start by, um, well, my personal experience, why not? The first time I met you, I think it was 2012, you were Deputy Prime Minister mm -hmm. of Denmark, and you shared the ECOFIN meeting, uh, meetings because uh, Denmark had the presidency. Uh, I was told that you were also the inspiration for the main character of TV series Borgen, where a female Prime Minister tried to uh, conciliate that uh, tough job with uh, her family. And after this long introduction, the question is, how different was to work for five million citizens in your own country and then move to work for 500 million in different countries with different expectations? For, for me, it was very different. Uh, but the first difference may sound sort of as a small one, but it was a language difference. Because I'd never worked in, uh, in anything but my mother tongue, and now I had to work in English and a little bit in French. So I had first to consider if I was saying what I wanted to say, that uh, people understood what I wanted to say, and that I understood what they wanted to say if, that, if they expressed what they wanted to say. So you have four different sort of sources of error. Um, and that sort of installed in me a great respect of the way we talk to one another. That maybe sometimes it's more important to express oneself in a simple way, to be understood, than to be very refined and maybe a little bit distant. But you feel that you have an audience that you don't know as well as at, back at home, because as I said, you know, people from Portugal to Finland, I'm Portuguese by the way, um, they have different expectations and uh, you were addressing problems all around Europe. So you felt some sort of connection. How did you get this connection with all the, the European citizens during your work at the Commission? Well, I think, um, well, my, the first thing was I have never felt as Danish as I do now, mm. having lived outside of Denmark for five years because I'm always the Dane around the table. Of course, I don't uh, take care of Danish interests, but, but I am, I'm the one who knows Denmark and the Danish code, uh, you know, firsthand. Just as well as my uh, Bulgarian colleague uh, knows uh, the Bulgarian code uh, firsthand. So we all contribute with something that the others don't really know in that intimate way. But that being said, I also feel more European than ever. Because all our differences uh, being very obvious, we work on something that we have in common. And one of the things that I have been privileged to work with is fair competition. And I think that's a very fundamental thing, and I have experienced that everyone can connect to that. That big or small, you should have a fair chance of making it. You don't want someone to agree on the prices in the back office. You don't want someone to, you know, make the best of it just because they became the big guy. And that I have met all over Europe, that people share. Mm -hmm. and, and that for me, personally, has been a, a very important experience to have a stronger national identity and a stronger European identity at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
So moving to what you have been actually doing for the last almost five years, you, your job is to make sure that powerful corporations like the ones in the internet uh, sector and many others uh, contribute in a fair way mm -hmm. to the economy, that the market serves the citizens, that globalization serves the citizens. That looks uh, a little bit like fighting a multi-head dragon. How do you do it? <laughs> because these are powerful uh, companies and most uh, of them are not even in Europe, they are in the United States, in China, elsewhere. So how do you address uh, that effort? Well, well, first of all, we have a, a team for each head, so to speak, uh, because I work with, uh, with 900 people who are not only you know, skilled and experienced, they're also very dedicated. Uh, and that, of course, is, is also another lesson learned, that something that looks like you know, a mountain that you cannot climb, when you have good people and teams that work together, it is doable. Um, the other thing is that Europe is, um, is a place where it's great to do business. Uh, everyone is welcome. American companies, Russian companies, uh, companies from all over the world. But you have to play by European rules. And um, hence the fines that you are being. Hence with. the fines, because if you don't, there is a high risk that you, high high risk that you get a high fine. So, um, so the thing is that no matter. The I think maybe if you put your hand Am a little I doing bit, something yeah, wrong? Maybe, yeah, I think. yes, probably. Um, if, um, if you have done something wrong, one of the things that I have experienced in, in these five years is there's a respect of the rule of law in Europe. Uh, people sometimes ask me, well, do they pay the fines? Mm. If, you, if you sort of get a, a bill that you have to pay a fine of the latest Google fine was one point, almost 1.5 billion euros, do they pay? Mm. I say, yes, they do pay. They may appeal the decision, but they do pay. Because I think that we, we live in, in a union where there is a very fundamental respect of still authorities and institutions and the rule of law. So, of course, you don't work only with uh, internet uh, sector companies, of course, many others. But uh, we want also to have the participation of the audience in this conversation. And we have Elias here with us that wants to ask a question about digital participation and, and, and somehow foresee a little bit what's going to be the future in that area. Can you please ask your question? Uh, yeah. Um, hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, my question is, um, my generation is heavily invested in social media apps and the internet. Um, I think much more than generations before us. Uh, and I think you, you represented uh, an electorate which didn't depend as heavily on the internet and those apps as um, my generation does. So my question is, in about 20 or 40 years, when uh, someone who has the same position as you for the European Union, uh, how is um, that person able to make a fist against a big uh, technology companies when the very electorate they serve uh, is so dependent on them and so the, mm. uh, the, 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 these companies have a big influence over them as well? That, that's an excellent question. Very good, Elias. Uh, <laughs> because this is exactly what we are, we are grappling with right now. Um, I think there is this growing sense of awareness that you shouldn't be depending on just on one media or one app. That you should try to seek uh, information and views from different sources. Um, I think it's important that we kind of also reinvent being together as we are here because it makes a difference if you can sense other people. It is another thing to be in the same room than to be in the same app. So I think there will be both sort of from our democracy with our elected representatives, a push back to give room for other kinds of democracy than one that is app-based. Uh, but I also think that there will be a wish for us not just to live in a digital world, but also to come together more. Uh, in my own field in competition, we're also pushing to make sure that we have the tools in place actually to get it if, if something is wrong. Uh, because what we see is that a lot of our economy will be based on platforms. 
platforms that will host smaller businesses, platforms that will give access to smaller businesses, uh, platforms that may be sort of the make or break also for farming. So everywhere in our economy. And this is now that we want to get it right, to get the tools that we need actually to maintain a fair Europe. Uh, so I think there's a number of things that we'll have to push for in the coming years, because otherwise, as you say, if we would take stock in 30, 40 years, I think we would end up in some kind of dystopia and not in a society that serves citizens or with markets that serves consumers. So that was really interesting question. In fact, and again, uh, you're explaining that all these companies, not only ones that are here, but a little bit around the world, um, this is a problem that affects Europeans and, 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 and people all around the world. So. Speaking a bit, a little bit only on geopolitics, let's make a little bit of a game. I will say the name of three countries, and you will say if it's a friend or a rival, and how to deal with it. So, United States of America, for example. It's a long-time ally. And you think it will carry on like that with Donald Trump if he's elected? Well, of course, it's it's different uh, because the President Trump and his administration they have a different take. But also with President Obama, we had discussions uh, and also controversies uh, on trade and on other issues. But I think when you have a friendship that stretches back decades, then you don't just give up on one another. Um, also because the United States is to some degree as diverse as Europe. Uh, and I, you know, I appreciate you know, for better and for worse. Uh, the friendship and the alliance that we have. What about China? That you know, there was recently this summit. I think you were quite involved in those uh, agreements and negotiations. So, a friend or a foe? Yeah. Well, here actually we've discussed that quite intensively, and we have said, well, China is to some degree a partner, but also a strategic competitor, and therefore anything but a developing country. Uh, but for instance, when we discuss climate change, uh, China would be a partner. When it comes to some sort of technology or AI, artificial intelligence, it may be a very strategic uh, competitor. And finally, Russia, which we always blame for all the disinformation. And is it also a friend or could be a friend one day? Will we always arrive? Well, I think sometimes we... Uh, uh, I don't think that we underestimate the threats because uh, if if our elections are interfered with, if our media is is interfered with, uh, becoming uh, biased because of, of state control of a foreign uh, power, that is indeed a very serious problem. But sometimes I think we, we underestimate there's also a Russian nation mm -hmm. uh, that we could connect with in, in different ways but not to underestimate the threats. And for some of the countries neighboring Russia, I think it's very closely felt. Uh, because sometimes their planes will have to go up uh, to show the door to, to Russian fighter planes. Yeah. And that, I think, is very important to respect. If you're very far from the Russian border, you may not feel it so strong. But if you're close to it, I think it's important that we respect the feeling and stand up for one another to make sure that we have sort of the size that we feel protected. And now during um, European elections uh, campaign time, how worried are you about uh, the capacity of Europe of um, understand what is true, what is fake, where this uh, misinformation comes from, who is actually trying to undermine our democracy? Are you optimistic or a bit scared, like some of us? Well, I think the, the only thing that sort of uh, controls my, my, my fear of, uh, of people intervening in our election is the fact that now we are so much more aware. Because we saw the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Uh, we have seen the throwing and people interfering. We see the fake news that are real fake news. Uh, so there's a different awareness. And when you're aware of something and the steps we have taken to counteract, different people coming together to offer sort of the real story and the facts of a case, when you're better prepared for something that seems scary, then you can actually deal with it. Uh, and that I find to be very different from two years ago or five years ago, where we didn't really, I think, knew what we were dealing with.
that's why festivals like this one are also important so that politicians address directly the audience and people get firsthand first the source of the information of, of what you intend to do once you get to powerful positions. But also that, that so many different people with sort of a very democratic heart comes together. Mm. Um, because this is the first, and, and what people I have met today, they come from all different sides to say, well, uh, I try to make people vote, I try to make people vote green, I try to make people engage in a civil society. And I think it's also important for someone with an activist mindset to meet other activists coming from different uh, organizations and different line of thinking to inspire one another. So now uh, you are almost finishing this uh, five years term. You've presented yourself to the elections in this Europe uh, team for a liberal group, uh, a team that has five women and two men, which these days is also some sort of a novelty. Uh, apparently, uh, there are other uh, parties that are not so keen on uh, changing a little bit of the, the gender uh, parity issue. Is it time for a woman to become president of the European Commission? And what would you do if you were that person? What would you be doing in terms of your leadership style, in terms of your priorities? Well, I, I think it's long overdue. Uh, when I go to pick up food in, in our canteen in the Bellemont, I pass by all the portraits of previous uh, commission presidents. And they're all men. Uh, but not only do we need that, we also need gender diversity in the commission. We're now nine women uh, out of, uh, of 28. And the thing is that it's not just about equality between men and women, it's also about better decision making. It's you about say that more, div more div diversity leads to better decisions. Is this accurate? Uh, this yes, uh, I definitely think so. If you look at uh, businesses, when they have diversity in leadership, uh, I think you can prove they do better. Uh, because when you don't, when you're not the same, then you ask different questions. You bring different sort of knowledge to the table, and the promise is also that men can have more diverse roles themselves. Mm. Because with diversity in itself, also uh, for you, more roles can be uh, taken upon you. So the promise of equality is also a promise of a fuller life. Uh, because we can sort of leave the stereotypes behind uh, and more fully engage. And this diversity d should be also at other levels, I mean, not just between men and women, but we don't see often people from different, let's say, ethnic origins or professional backgrounds, either in the parliament or in the commission. So would that also be beneficial for, the, for understanding what the citizens want? Yes, indeed, and also in, in commission services. We, now, we took the decision on one of the first days of this commission to say, by the end of this mandate, 40% of senior management should be women. Uh, you know, no laws, uh, no official quotas, no nothing. A decision that within five years we will achieve this. And already now, uh, after four years and some, uh, we have achieved uh, at least 40% as uh, women in senior management in, in commission. But we still have a lot to do when it comes to uh, fully reflect, ref, reflecting uh, what the European Union looks like. Mm -hmm. Of course, with different nationalities, a lot of different languages are spoken over uh, a lunch table uh, in the Commission, but we are not at all uh, representative um, when it comes to, uh, to the European citizen as such. Mm -hmm. And it's in some cases, in, even going backwards, that we have now one member state that has a government composed exclusively by men which I don't know if the audience knows where, which country it is, but it's Lithuania. So um, maybe you can uh, send a word to the prime minister and ask him why he doesn't want to work with women uh, for his uh, mandate. Anyway, uh, we have maybe someone that also wants to ask a question, not only to the prime minister of Lithuania, but to you, which is Manon Desayes. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing correctly, European Women's Lobby. Manon, are you here? All right, you wanted also to ask a question on, on this issue of gender parity, isn't it? Hi, uh, just to present the European Women's Lobby, we're a feminist organization, 
and we are the largest umbrella organization of women's NGOs all across Europe with around 2,000 members. Uh, so we are running a, a campaign right now for the European elections where we're asking for parity in the European Parliament, but also for women's rights to be at the core of the EU policies. So we need gender equality to be at the heart of the European agenda to ensure that everyone's rights are protected and improved. So at the European Women's Lobby, we are calling for um, the establishment of a directorate general that would be uh, focused solely on gender equality. So we just wanted to know what are your thoughts about that? Well, it's to have just one specific uh, directorate for, for gender equality, I think there is a risk that it will be a silo. Because actually you find gender issues in, in everything you do. Uh, also for men. Uh, so I think it is, there is an, a number of things that will have to be sort of horizontally important uh, no matter what you do. Uh, because it's, it's a changed way of thinking. Uh, equality is not just something you sort of put on as a label by the end of the process. It's a starting point. Because if you start by thinking about, well, we live in a world where we're different, half is women, half is men, then already there you start thinking also about the data that you collect before you make a proposal when you do an impact assessment. When you then collect data, then you, you get a different picture. Uh, take, for instance, such a thing as standard um, personal protective equipment. Women and male bodies, they are different. Uh, so you have to take that into consideration. In doing that, you need different data. If you want to fight inequality in pay, you need data, good data, in order to say what's behind this. Because when you know, and if you have you know, the willingness to act upon your knowledge, then you can change things. And this is why I think it's a, it's a task for each and every directorate. Even in, in my directorate in competition, we think about gender. Because in some countries, for instance, you have a semi-privatized market for childcare. Uh, if there is a, a good quality childcare that is affordable, it's easier for the care person, which is very often a woman, actually to work. So we are also looking for ways where competition may actually allow for men and women to be equally present, not only in their working life, but also in their life as a parent. Uh, which is why I think, well, we should have, of course, equality in, in pay, equality in, in power, but we should also have equality in parental leave. I think it would be great if we put, could promise the next generation that their fathers would also be much more present when they're very small. So thank you very much, Manon. Let's, let's continue with this topic that you are now uh, about, you know, social inequalities and uh, to have a society that is this has a better balance. Um, well, for that, we also need money. I mean, in the sense that uh, to inf invest in infrastructure, to adapt to climate change, to have better education, we need resources. But, uh, you know, middle class is being squeezed. Uh, apparently, governments don't are not able even to properly tax these big corporations. Uh, there was this uh, financial markets uh, transactions uh, uh, taxing that was also an idea in, in the end, nothing came out of it. So how to find the resources to deal with so, so, so many pressing issues and to give a better quality of life for, for the citizens? Well, exactly the taxation issue is an important issue. Uh, because I think, well, um, val value should be taxed where it's generated. Uh, so you just don't move your profits from one country to another country to a third country where it may not be taxed at all or very little. Um, and in, in my cases, what we see is that some businesses or groups of businesses, well, they have relied on uh, specific arrangements that are selective, they're only for them, and yet the majority of businesses, they pay their taxes. And this is, of course, a push for, for tax fairness. Uh, digital taxation as well. When you do comparable data, digital business, they would pay on average 9% in tax, where other businesses will pay 23% in tax. 
This is obviously not fair. A lot of money that should be coming into the economy. Exactly. The real economy. Exactly, into uh, the real economy. And if our corporate taxation was invented, I think, a century or more ago, and if we do not learn corporate taxation about a digital world, then it will not understand how value is being created when everything becomes digital. So we need to update our understanding of corporate taxation to be relevant when everything becomes digital. Because otherwise, well, then state coffers, they will just lose out. And as you say, we have a lot of things to invest in. Exactly. Well, when we think that a quarter of the Europeans actually live in poverty, you know, in such a, a rich continent, tra around 22% of people don't uh, have enough money to, to make a living. Uh, one in four Europeans struggle to pay the rent of their house. Um, a precarious job is not the norm. So what we have this single market, which has achieved a lot, but could we also have you know, a single welfare system? Could we move to things like basic minimum wage for everyone, equal social benefits? Do you foresee a time where Europeans will be also equal in that sense, or at least the ones that are in the weakest link, let's say? Well, I think it will take some time. Um, we have placed very little sort of uh, uh, power in our European democracy when it comes to social issues. So my colleague, uh, Mayan uh, Chushin, uh, has done a very impressive job in then taking it as a political issue. So instead of making it a legal thing, because we have very limited ways of doing that, then make a political pledge to make sure that uh, social benefits are more available, um, that childcare is good, the things that allows you to live a full life. Uh, and the strategy is quite simple, is to say that we should converge on still higher levels. Um, because then you can see that the prosperity created in member states actually is translated also into welfare. And the good thing right now is that some of the countries where citizens on average have the least, they're growing much more than sort of more traditional uh, richer member states which actually do mean that we are converging, that those who were poorer become richer, while the rich, they don't come even richer as fast. And that's a very good thing, but it will still take a lot of time. And I also think that it's important that we have room for member states taking different decisions, because we have strong national democracies, and it's a fair thing that you have a different preference mm -hmm. in each and every member state, uh, because the goal is not for us to be the same, uh, the goal is for us to be an inclusive union, but have room for the differences expressed in national democracies. Very well. Let's speak about one topic that is now on all newspapers, that is also mentioned in polls that concerns a lot of citizens, which is that, you know, in order to make progress in the continent and in the planet, we need to have a planet, actually. So the environment uh, and the climate change issues uh, are very important, not only in the sense of, of the quality of life, but in terms of the, a new economy that might be developing in, in transport, in infrastructure, in our agricultural model. Um, apparently, the next budget for the next seven years, a quarter of that money will be dedicated to environment and, and, and climate change. Do you believe that, you know, big power of interest like oil and gas and coal companies and a lot of governments depending on that type of, of uh, wealth will keep pushing uh, this agenda to later in the future that we still have a lot of time to deal with this? Well, well I see progress. Um, actually, quite some time ago, it was decided that if a coal mine is in economic trouble, you cannot save it. You cannot put in money just to restructure it, uh, to make it continue. But you can put in money actually to close it and allow people to move on. Mm -hmm. um, and that happens. And we were sort of, oh, will it really happen? But actually, it does happen. You have e examples. Yes, yes we have a number of examples where people said, oh, this, this mine, since people don't want coal anymore and prices are coming down, uh, we cannot rescue this place. So we'll close it, but we'll invest in giving people new skills, in investing in new ways of doing business in this region. 
because I think it's, it's very important that when we transition, that we do that in an inclusive manner, that you can see yourself that you're part of this. Also because if you have been in the mining uh, industry for four generations, it's not just your job, it's also your culture. This is what you do. And, and this is why it's not just people who are against transitioning into a, a more climate-wise economy. It's also a cultural travel to do things so differently. Uh, and this is why climate change is, I think, something we should take as a given, because it's there. But we have to discuss how to deal with it and how to enable that to create also many, many jobs of the future. Uh, when we get rid of waste, to reuse resources, a lot of jobs will be created there. But that will go to have to be done in each and every sector. We have uh, with us uh, Jeremy Waits from the uh, European Environmental Bureau that wants to ask you a question on, on this topic. Uh, yes, thank you, Isabel. Good evening, Commissioner. Uh, yes, we would very much like to hear from you uh, a bit more about your perspective on, it, on environment. Uh, it was a little bit less than five years ago that the Juncker priorities were unveiled. It was before you were a, a commissioner. Um, and they sent shockwaves, literally, through the environmental movement and indeed through the environmental sector uh, because of the very limited environmental content, uh, with the exception of climate change that you, mm. you've just spoken about. Uh, now, in fact, I would acknowledge that the commission that you're part of has achieved quite a lot on environment, but this has been because of huge pushback from member states from the parliamentarians and, of course, from the NGOs. So it's been actually despite rather than because of the Juncker priorities. Uh, I want to ask you about your views about the place of environment in the priorities of the next commission. And zooming out a little bit from environment, uh, place of sustainability, would you see sustainability as one among other key priorities for the commission, or would you actually see it as the overarching priority within which other priorities should be there? And which would you see as the key environmental challenges uh, for the Commission, uh, the new Commission, where at the moment the Commission and the EU itself is not doing enough? Thank you. Well, that's a, as you can hear, I'm not in the habit of answering anything short. But, um, <laughs> but that being said, this is a real challenge uh, because a lot can be said about it. Um, we all uh, signed up for the 17 development goals. And that, in a way, ought to be what everything we do is directed to fulfill. Because the great thing about the, 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 the development goals is that they are for everyone, for every country on our globe, no matter what you think of yourself. If you're developed or are more developed, that's not the point. The goals are for everyone. And that would also mean that sustainability would be sort of an, an, a thing that is integrated in everything we do, because it's a strategy. Sustainability is a strategy, because when you start thinking about it, well, then you, you see that this is not something that you should just put on at the end of a process. It's something that will allow you to create jobs in a new way, to understand growth in a new way to decouple creation of jobs and better opportunities from our uh, environmental and, uh, and carbon footprint. And that, of course, is the challenge. Uh, and this is why, of course, you say that it was despite of, of the priorities, the fact that things were achieved because of the uh, commitment of uh, member states and, and NGOs uh, and others also shows that we can have a discussion about, well, how, how do we do this? Because it's not uncontroversial. Uh, we saw that when we discussed a thing like glyphosate. How do we get the right uh, research on board to, to figure out how to use it, if to use it, which ended up in a shorter um, prolongation of the, uh, of the right to use it, uh, with some member states taking more steps. Um, with the discussions about uh, endocrine disruptors, the thing that can change your ability to have children that can disturb sort of the gender identity of uh, animals, uh, fish uh, in, in nature. So we have a, a big uh, push to do, but we have to do it in an inclusive way so that people don't scare off. 
Uh, I think that the chemistry that we live with uh, and in is one of the main issues uh, because uh, those things that are harmful for humans, uh, that will influence not only the human body and our societies, but also the nature that we live in. Um, and in that, of course, we need to use part of our funds also for research in order to figure out, well, what goals to set, how to move out of the things that we find to be uh, dangerous in order to uh, invent uh, substitutes for that. Very well, it's really uh, enormous, gigantic uh, theme in terms of, of our future. But I wanted now to move on uh, at this point of our conversation to a theme that is kind of the elephant in the room all the time, which is, of course, Brexit. We had another summit yesterday. Another date was set, 31st of October. But I would like maybe to do a short introduction to this theme by reading a little bit of um, a chapter of a book called Autumn by Ali Smith and his British order. She, when the referendum was announced, she started a series of books about what was going on in the UK. So she wrote Autumn, then Winter. She just released Spring now, and uh, summer will come uh, in the future. And in one of the chapters, it's only three pages, and, and she writes something like this. I'm just going to read a little bit. All across the country, people felt it was the wrong thing. All across the country, people felt it was the right thing. All across the country, people felt they really lost. All across the country, people felt they really won. All across the country, people felt they'd done the right thing and other people had done the wrong one. All across the country, people looked up on Google, what is the you? All across the country, people look up on Google, move to Scotland. All across the country, people look at in Google Irish passport applications. All across the country, people felt unsafe. All across the country, people were laughing. All across the country, people felt legitimized. All across the country, people felt shocked. All across the country, people felt righteous. All across the country, people felt like they counted for nothing. So these divisions. They're not, uh, they exist only, uh, not only in the UK. In the European Union, they had a lot of people feeling excluded. The globalization has put them aside. They are not prepared. 40% of Europeans don't have the basic skills for this digital economy that we were talking about. So what lessons do we have to learn from the Brexit uh, situation also for the, for the continental European Union? But I, I don't think we should sort of take the the Brexit lesson, because I think it's, it's, it goes even deeper than that, because it's exactly about, uh, do you feel counted in? Um, if, you, if you're fired from your job, then often or within a certain time frame, you can find a new job. But if you feel that you're fired from your society, then, then where do you go? Uh, and I think with the financial crisis and the sovereign debt crisis um, and with uh, globalization and things becoming more digital, there is sort of an, an unsecure insecurity. What is this going to mean that I share? Because we don't know. And if it's not discussed and not addressed, I think frustration can turn into anger. Um, in the case of the UK, they found an enemy, a common enemy that would be that was the European Union. Yeah, but I think there's also maybe in the specific Brexit case, I think there's also a lesson to be learned for for politicians uh, and media. Um, now, I'm I'm a, a happily married woman, but I think if you if you bitch a little bit every day, you end up getting divorced. <laughs> and uh, sound advice. <laughs> And, and this ongoing, never sort of uh, fully engaging. There were uh, some internal political games, you know. There was, the, the co the, the, there was also a referendum without the proper debate. Uh, we will have now six months extension, probably a, a new prime minister maybe, a new referendum. Do you think at this time it, there's still a, a solution? Uh, will we still be on time of keeping the UK inside the European Union? Oh, it's already lost. Well, actually, I, I have come to a point where I've, I think that it, they, they got to figure out what they want. 
But uh, they have to know about it, no? They have to debate it more, don't, don't you think? I, I don't know how they will organize things. <laughs> but Nobody knows. But we have, we have things to do. And we cannot allow Brexit to overshadow important things. Because it keeps occupying our mind, our media, precious time that heads of state of government could use by discussing with one another what to do next, how to agree more, what are the important things that we want to deal with. Because right now we have no agreement on how to protect refugees, how to deal with illegal immigration. Uh, we're still discussing how to deal with, uh, with our external borders. Uh, we have a lot of discussions about trade. And very important discussion that eventually will influence our everyday life. And, and yet, they spend hour after hour after hour on Brexit. So I do hope that with, with the now prolongation and the fact that they can leave whatever day they're ready, then it's a British question. But if they get to elect European, uh, uh, Brit uh, British get to elect uh, MEPs now, again, they will be participating in the election probably. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, a cause of concern that they will try somehow to block things, to make it more difficult, even if it's only until October probably? Yeah, but if you want to leave something, why would you then want to ruin it before you go? I, th I think that would be a very strange thing. Um, and anyway, now we have the campaign, then the parliament, of course, has to, um, to cons make their own uh, decisions about the president and committees and all of that. And after that, the parliament will be, you know, very, very engaged in how to establish a new commission. Uh, you know, having the oral examinations of each and every commissioner to see if they are uh, probably uh, engaged to do their job. And only then, and then we will be by late September, uh, October something, you will sort of get back to a more sort of legislative uh, work uh, and the, the budget for the next seven years. So I think there's also a limit, as even if you had bad intentions, how much you can express those bad intentions. Let's hope that uh, Mr. Michel Barnier is coming after Commissioner Vestaya will give us some more explanation on that. We can maybe pass to a topic that I think you are keen on speaking, which is also migration and the fact that uh, because that was a topic very important in the UK, the fact that they felt they didn't have any control about how many people were coming to the, to the UK, where they were coming from, etc. Um, so far, we don't have a common policy. The military uh, rescue operation in the Mediterranean doesn't have boats anymore to rescue people, it's just airplanes. There will be another crisis. We know there will be another war, a natural disaster. So are we going again as European Union to go to the emergency motto? Do you have any hope that in the, with the next commission we'll find a common policy with it in this time? Well, we have, uh, we have asked member states to make sure that we get the legal basis. Uh, but only five out of seven proposals uh, are agreed upon. So there's still work to do. Uh, and I think we need to, to continue very intensively with this very broad strategy that was made back 2015 when many, many refugees came. Uh, and this, the thing was that back then, of course, it was urgent to save people from drowning. But we treated it as as, as urgent to invest in and building up partnerships uh, with African countries. And that may only give results in five or 10 or 15 years. But if you don't invest now in something that will produce results in the long term, then we can do nothing but to try to save people. So it was a number of things that had to be done at the same time. Uh, also to establish the European uh, Coast and Border Control that we're now pushing for to make a real, real thing um, and to start preparing for sort of a parallel to the ESTA system. Uh, both things allowing us to know in much more detail who's coming and going in Europe. Mm. But, but we need some of the most mm. important uh, pieces of this puzzle and they are not agreed upon yet. Because what sometimes we see, you know, a lot of the uh, migrant, economic migrants and also refugees want to go to Germany or Sweden. 
uh, because that is the image of El Dorado in Europe they have, but there are actually some member states that uh, wanted to receive more people. They need them as a work, they have universities where they could uh, take some of these young people and um, I can give an example of Portugal that was trying to bring people from Greece and from Italy to Portugal and uh, the union couldn't find the basis, not even in a bilateral way, of redistributing these people. So are you also losing the opportunity to do a, a order integration of people that would be a welcome in some member states? But this is how, where things become tricky, uh, because there are basically three different situations. I think that Europeans have a big heart for people who seek refuge, because anyone would wish to have the same protection if we were the one who had to flee. But then you have the question of immigration for more economic reasons. And I think it is important to say, what well, you cannot illegally uh, immigrate uh, to Europe. You can do that legally. We ought to establish ways where you legally can immigrate if a country needs people to come, you have businesses who need people to come to work for them with different skills, that would be an important input to establish yourself in that country, also to develop jobs for the people who are there already. And I think it's very important to be sort of quite precise here, mm -hmm. uh, because we cannot have it that you have sort of a de facto acceptance that you can come, but in irregular way. Mm -hmm. uh, it is important that we know who's here, why they're here. Are they here for protection and given asylum, or are they here to work? Okay, we are almost uh, at the end of this um, session. Uh, I wanted to, uh, going back a little bit to the gender issue, maybe Manon will be pleased. You said that uh, one of your favorite sayings, I think it is, if a woman wants to go place to places, she should bring her own leather. I think you have one in your office. I read it in The Guardian, I think. If you will not have a role in the commission, uh, where will you bring your leather? What are we going to do in the European Parliament? What are your concrete plans for your political future? Well, the, the thing is that in my... Uh, I, I never really planned for my working life uh, because I have this feeling that planning, it works a little bit like blinders. You know, the thing you put on horses, so they're not disturbed. But in my, in my experience, the important thing is to allow yourself to be disturbed. Because sometimes the next thing happens out here, in the corner of your eye. And you should be able to see that. Um, and the other thing that I have experienced is that if, if your next job should be a good one, then you better do the job you have already with your best of efforts. You would feel happy at European Parliament? Well, you know, I think I will feel happy doing a number of different things. And if nothing else, then in order to make up for all the flying while being a commissioner, I can start planting trees. <laughs> um, just to... On, on, on that line, I, because it's interesting they say they're open to, to, other, um, to other options. Because you come from a family with some uh, political experience, I think, from your grandfather to your mother. And we are also here talking about uh, youth and uh, the uh, political participation of the next generation. Uh, if one of your daughters wanted to go into politics, uh, what would you think about it and what advice would you give her? or them, depending on which. Well, I, I, would, I would wonder, because now she has experienced it firsthand, is this really what you want to do? Um, but the thing is, I, I never really wanted to be a politician. Uh, I, d I wanted to take part in my community. So when I was in primary school, in my school we couldn't, we c there was no food not even a small yogurt or a juice or a piece of bread. If you had left home in a hurry in the morning and you didn't have breakfast, there was nothing you could do. So we engaged to make it available. Uh, a group of us said, well, let's establish, you know, a small thing here, uh, not for profit, where you can buy just a simple thing. 
Uh, and later, when I got to university, I engaged in trying to develop new subjects. I'm trained as an economist, and we wanted to be able to talk about economy in plain language. And once you're an economist, you need to sort of retrain doing that, uh, sort of to develop new, lang new, uh, new courses. So my ambition was to uh, engage in what I was doing. And then one thing, thing to the other. So my advice would not be to try to be a politician. My advice would be to engage in your community. And when you see uh, these young women, like uh, uh, the young uh, Swedish girl, and, and now Nuna de Viver as well in Belgium, uh, going to the streets, especially for climate change, um, a lot of these young people are also, of course, young girls. Uh, does that make you more optimistic about the future generation that will come into politics? Oh, but it, it makes me happy. Uh, I'm a great admirer of, uh, of Greta Thunberg. Mm. I think it is great what she's doing because she, she has a point. This point to say, well, I will sacrifice part of my future because schooling, going to school and getting skills and getting insights, that is part of my future. And I will sacrifice that because if you don't do something, that future will be very different because cl climate change will change the way we live because the weather will be so much wilder and it will change the way our, our countries look and what we'll have to deal with. And I like, it's a simple, straightforward point and she invests herself in doing that. And that I find to be very, very, uh, that's a good inspiration. Unfortunately, Greta Thunberg was not allowed to give a speech uh, in the plenary at the European Parliament in Strasbourg by the current uh, MEPs, we hope that maybe after the election she will be invited there. Thank you very much, Commissioner Vestia, for coming and to share all your ideas and your prospects for the future. Thank you very it much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, Michel Bernier should be coming uh, in a few minutes, I believe. So, please uh, uh, either take a, a little break, but we would really appreciate that you stay uh, for, for the next session. Let's try not to disrupt and keep ourselves inside very warm, let's say. <laughs>